You see our financial summary down there. Um, we've raised about $530 for Mama Flora. She's the new outreach mission that we are doing in Kenya from Jared's mission trip. Uh, Saturday the 27th, this coming Saturday, there's a concert here at 6.30. The new Tulsans and One More Road. And of course, we'll take a love offering like we do for all of our performers. The 7th Annual Two Lakes Golf Tournament. Sa two Saturdays from now, August 3rd, it's going to be at Early Wine North Course. You know, I don't want to say too much about that, but we call it a golf tournament just because there aren't any other ways to describe what we do. Because we have golf clubs and we have golf balls, but that's not really what we do. Uh, let's see, Exploring the New Jerusalem by Ven Van Vactor, a continuing study on heaven, 6 p.m. on Sunday nights. Don't forget Wild and Wonderful Wednesdays as well. There are some more July birthdays down there that we sang to last week. Reminder, you can give your tithes through the church's uh, PayPal account. Any other announcements we need to make at the moment? Anything else that we, don't, uh, that we need to get mentioned? All right, let's close this portion and turn it over to Brother Levi for, uh, for some music. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what you do for us. Father, we thank you for the, the many, many examples you give us each and every day, all week long, this morning, yesterday afternoon, last night, three days ago, of your love for us and all of the grace that you show for us, the mistakes that we make, we... The, the decisions that we make, the things that we think, maybe things that we should do and don't, things that we should say and don't. Father, everything that makes us human is covered by the blood of your Son on the cross. You have given us a way back to salvation. Father, we have, we ex have accepted your Son, and therefore we are washed whiter than snow. Lord, Father God, I pray that you will bless the service this morning. You will see what we, what we say and what we sing, how we think, how we pray, how we worship together, Father, that all of it will be, will be a, blessing, a blessing and you will find favor in all of it. May we be reminded through this morning's service that just because we are gathered here, our worship of you does not end at noon when we walk out that door. Our worship of you just begins, it takes a different tack, a different path. Thank you, Father, for all that you do for us. In your holy and great name, Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. It's great to see you all this morning. It was a great week teaching at the University of Arkansas camp, so it was a lot of fun. We had about 700 high school students there from, from Texas, Oklahoma, Missouri, and Kansas around us that went together, and it was fun getting to direct those orchestras, so it was very enjoyable, but I missed you. Glad to be back. So let's stand and sing, would you? What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought Since Jesus came into my heart I have lied in my soul for which long I have sought Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart Floods of joy o'er my soul Like the sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart I'm possessed of a hope That is steadfast and sure Since Jesus came into my heart and no dark clouds of doubt now my pathway obscure since jesus came into my heart since jesus came into my heart since jesus came into my heart floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart. Verse 4, I shall go. I shall go there to dwell in that city I know. Since Jesus came into my heart. And I'm happy, so happy as onward I go. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart.
my heart since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart. Amen. Good seeing you. You may be seated. I don't know a lot about music, but I know that's tickling the ivories really, really well. <laughs> that was really cool. Harper, come up here, please. In, in a few moments, we're going to meet and greet. Um, we're going to have a prayer service a little bit later. We're also waiting on one of our, our contestants to arrive so we can have a baptism. Um, but in preparation for the prayer time a little bit later, if you want a copy of the prayer list, raise your hand. This young lady will hand them to you. It's important for every one of us to stay in touch with, our, with the needs of our church, with our immediate family, with our friends, with our national scene, all of that. So she'll, have, she'll hand them out until they're gone. While she's doing that, I, Jesse Duplantis is a uh, funny um, evangelist. Has anybody heard of Jesse? All right, so he did this once, and I did it this morning in my Sunday school class, and I'm going to try it here as well. I'm going to give a five-second countdown, and we are all, for about four seconds, five seconds, I want everybody to laugh, your normal laugh, okay? Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, that's enough. It didn't work for him either. That, really, that was it? Isn't it good to laugh? To feel the sadness and pain, worry and stress just melt away? Some laugh silently. Others laugh like roaring lions. Some of you didn't laugh at all. Others whistle their joy. Laughing is scriptural. It is a gift from God himself, and it helps us cope in difficult times. Charlie Chaplin said, a day without laughter is a day wasted. George R. R. Martin quoted, laughter is poison to fear. And then I got four verses out of the scriptures to back that up. In Luke chapter 6, blessed are you that weep now, for you will laugh. In Job chapter 8, we know the story of Job, what he was going through. And an angel was talking to Job and said, he will once again fill your mouth with laughter. In Proverbs, three different verses, chapter 15, a joyful heart makes a cheerful face. In chapter 15, for the happy heart, get this, life is a continual feast. For the happy heart, life is a continual feast. That's really cool. And then uh, in Proverbs chapter 17, a cheerful heart is good medicine. So that is why we take a few moments to meet and greet. That is one of the underlying reasons why we gather together. The scripture says, gather together in fellowship, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. But we do that, not just for that, but to support each other. And in doing so, we laugh. We enjoy each other as a family. So find a reason today when you leave, wherever you go, whoever you're with, Find a reason to let joy in and let's poison Satan's hope for sorrow by laughing in his face. How about we do that? We have a memory verse we're going to say. Um, uh, today is going to be a good day in the Southwest because... This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad. And we believe that. We live it. We do. We believe it. Tomorrow is going to be maybe a better day to some people because according to that forecast, tomorrow is supposed to be about 15 degrees colder than today or cooler. So that's going to be kind of fun. I'm going to enjoy it because it's supposed to be a north wind, which means I can go fishing at Lake Hefner and not get washed away. So I'm looking forward to that as well. If anybody wants to join me at 5 o'clock in the morning, let me know. All right, so let's take a few moments to uh, meet and greet each other. Take a couple of minutes. Um, our, our baptismal lady is not here yet, so if you take three minutes, you're okay. Let's meet.
with Jesus makes it right. Have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our troubles. Hear our famous cry. Answer by your pride. We'll be healing prayer. We'll turn it. You know a little fire is burning. Find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Amen. It's always an exciting day here at Two Lakes Baptist Church when we have a baptism. It's always an exciting day when we come to church and, and we're able to worship the Lord. But today is special. Every time that we have a baptism, it's special. And this morning, uh, Laurie Willa Postoke is coming to be baptized. Her name is Laurie. Most of you know her by her nickname, Willow. But I know that last Sunday, God did a deep work in your heart. You recommitted your life to Christ. And I want to ask you a very important decision. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. Amen. Amen. In obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your public profession of faith in Him, I now baptize you, my sister in Christ, Laurie Willa Postok, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. For you are buried with Christ in baptism, and you are raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Will you join me? Just join with me as we pray for Willow. Father God, we thank you so much for the work that you are, have done in her life and you are doing in her life and you will continue to do in her life. And Lord, myself and this church body, we hold her up today and ask for your blessing upon her life, your leadership in her life, your protection in her life. Lord, we just ask that you would be with her and put a hedge around her, protect her from the enemy and use her, Lord, for your kingdom. Bless her, Lord, and let her be a minister of love and truth uh, and an ambassador for you, Lord, that many will come to know you because of her testimony, because of her life. Bless her in every way, God. Help her, lead her, and may she, she fulfill her divine purpose and destiny in Christ. And we pray this in our Savior's name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. chorus of this song says, Glorious, glorious, glorious is thy name, O you Lord. Did so well. How appropriate after a baptism to sing his glory, that he cares about us that much, that we get to see and experience somebody that gives a public profession of faith to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this morning. Amen? Hold that breath on that glorious. I want to see if we can make it all the way through on that one breath. Let's get a big one when we sing it. Here we go. Blessed Savior. Blessed Savior, we adore Thee. We Thy love and grace proclaim. Thou art mighty, Thou art holy. Glorious is Thy matchless name. Big breath. Glorious, glorious, glorious is thy name, O Lord. 
glorious, glorious, glorious is thy name, O Lord, great Redeemer, great Redeemer, Lord and Master, light of all eternal days. Let the saints of every nation sing thy just and endless praise. Glorious, glorious, glorious is thy name, O Lord. Glorious. Glorious, glorious is thy name, O Lord. Verse 4, come, O come. Come, O come, immortal Savior. Come and take thy royal throne. Come and reign and reign forever. Be the kingdom all thine own. Glorious, glorious, glorious is thy name, O Lord. Glorious, glorious, glorious is thy name, O Lord. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 Merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Holy, 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 all the saints adore Thee. Casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee. Who were ten ten? Evermore shall be just voices, verse three. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, all thy work shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons. Blessed Trinity. Sing with me, you unravel me. 
You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again to your family. Your blood flows through my veins. Cause I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Sing it, I'm no longer a slave. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. You split the sea. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. Sing that again. You split the sea. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. Cause I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Father God, as the music keeps playing, I just pray that I want to thank you, Lord, for giving us a conqueror's mentality, Father God. Father, that we have conquered the grave and we have conquered death and we had conquered fear, as we just sang about, because of your great name. Father God, help us to never let us, help us to not take for granted the sacrifice that Jesus made. Father God, as he came and, and lived for you. Father God, as he felt what we felt, as he wept in the garden and he didn't want to go and face the death and have to turn his face away from, from you, Father God, but that he did it for us. That he took our sin on that cross, Father God. He said it is finished. Father God, and three days later he rose. Father God, if there's anybody in here this morning that has fear that's crippling them, whether it be fear of finances, whether it be fear of, of persecution from somebody at their workplace or someone in their family, whether it be fear for their health, fear for, for their kids, 
fear for their family. Father God, just anything, you are so much greater than that fear. Father God, and I just tell them this morning in your name that that they can cast on you. Father God, they don't have to deal with it alone. Father God, you call us to have community right here in this church. We've seen it so much. My family has seen it so much, Father God, that there are so many people here that love you and serve you that will just wrap their, wrap their arms around you, Father God, and take care of you. And Father God, that's your love expressed through them. Father God, before we go into this next section of prayer where we're on our knees, I'm going to ask that we sing that one more time, that we are no longer a slave to fear. And whoever it is in this audience, Father God, that I've got a feeling about right now, they need to know that they have an almighty God that they serve, and they can cast that fear on you 100%, Father God. That is a burden that's lifted because of you and your love and your grace and your mercy that you show us. So we're going to sing it again, Father God, with true passion and true intent that we are no longer slaves. Just that verse. Let's sing it. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Father God, that is true this morning, and in your name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Every time we pray, we prove that we are not a child of fear. Because we have a God that defeated fear, that defeated death, that defeated everything that Satan can throw at us. This morning, uh, I want to share just something out of, you, out of the uh, daily bread. The lesson today was a little boy that, that got a new game for some type of a holiday, and he couldn't figure it out after reading the rules. A, another childhood friend came along that knew how to play the game and taught the child, just like a mentor would. And we've been throwing that word around here for a few weeks. This morning's scripture, Paul is talking to, to Titus, and it's in chapter 2, and he's talking about how Titus should make himself available to the different members of the family, to the different members of the church family. You must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled. Teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not slanderous or addicted to too much wine. Uh, urge the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be subject to their husbands. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. Set an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and a soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. That's really cool. Paul was giving Titus, Paul was mentoring Titus and encouraging Titus to mentor who he was going to go visit with. And that's what we do here as well. When we pray for people on this list, or we pray for our prayer lists, for people that make uh, things known to us, uh, they are coming to us as, as family members, and we mentor to each other in the way that we pray. So don't be ashamed to pray silently. Pray with love in your hearts and with strong voice and, and strong eyes. Uh, the only prayer that may not be effective is the one not heard. Maybe. God hears all prayers, but does he hear them if we don't say them? That's for you guys. That's for us. Uh, Ginger told me this morning that her brother Charles Nelson is having open heart surgery on Thursday at Mercy Heart and to lift him and her up as well. For those of you that want to come up here, the altar is open certainly. If you have a prayer request, please raise your hand or stand where you are and we will come to you. And in just a few moments, I'll lead us in a closing prayer for our offertory. Anybody have a prayer request? I did, I did want to say uh, my mom and uh, was having a lot of trouble breathing, and so she's in the Oakland Heart Hospital right now. I so, understand. But, but then on the other side, the praise, my grandmother uh, gets out of rehab on Tuesday uh, through an absolute miraculous work of God. So, yeah. Amen. Amen. 
for those of you that have been here for the last uh, four or five weeks, you know the miracles that Levi's family has been experiencing and Levi himself. So we all have seen those. Let's enjoy another miracle this morning through prayer. Any other requests other than Levi and, and his power? So Deidre has a request. I'll let some of you gather around Deidre and share that with her as well. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what you do for us. Father, we thank you for the spirit that is here this morning. I feel you, spirit. The tithes that we are about to offer, Father, we know that some it may be meager to some, and it be, might, might be much to many. Father, we know that in your hands it will be the exact amount needed, that all will go well. We give it eagerly. We give it willingly. We give it with love because we want to see the miracles that you can do with something that we can't, and we owe it to you anyways. Father, thank you for the message that Brother Ben is about to give. We thank you for the for the the baptism that Willow went through, Father, another example of a, of a saved soul that Satan no longer has control over. Father, we thank you for all that you do for us, for the belief and the faith that Levi shows for his mom, for, the, for our family members here praying for Ginger's brother. Father, so many things here. We give you the praise in all that we do. Amen. I consider this the ultimate love song, and if you can't sing a love song to the one who created you, who could you sing a love song to? This 
love is so deep It's more than I can stand I melt in your peace It's overwhelming me me of Mary sitting at the Savior's feet. Hallelujah. And uh, it's so good to see you guys here. And you know, I've already really been blessed this morning, haven't you? Just by the Spirit of the Lord here. Yeah, the baptism, the worship. Our children are being dismissed to uh, Sunday school. And I believe we're going to finish the back of the bulletin this morning. I, I think. I think so. Uh, I'm not going to make any promises. But uh, we've spent quite a, few, quite a bit of time, quite a few Sundays on uh, spiritual warfare. Uh, that's part of maturity. It's part of maturity. And so uh, as, as we mature, we become freedom fighters, and, uh, and that's what we do. Uh, I, wanna, I heard something a long time ago, and I might have shared it with some of y'all before, but um, there was this little boy, and he had a grandmother, and... and you know, there were some real scoundrels in the town. They lived in a small town. And she would never say bad things about anybody. Not even these people that did her wrong. And, and, and so one day, the little boy was just kind of exasperated with his grandma. You know, said, Grandma, I bet you would even have something good to say about the devil. She said, well, he's always on the job. All right? He is. He is. We know him as 
the devil, Beelzebub, Satan, the dragon, the old serpent, the deceiver, the ruler of this world, the evil one, the god of this age, Belial, our adversary, the father of lies, and the prince of the power of the air. Those are just some of the names. There are other names, but he is our adversary. He is here to, he opposes us, but the good news is greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. You have power over him, and he tries to get us to fear, but perfect love casts out all fear. And God has given us the Holy Spirit, and the Bible says, uh, you have not received this, uh, the, the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So we are, when we become afraid, we, we trust in the Lord, and we, we trust in his power and his pro providence. And again, we have authority over the enemy. Now, this is part of a continuing series called The Blessings of Church, a series on why you should get out of bed on Sunday morning, take a shower, get dressed, grab some breakfast, brush your teeth, grab your Bible, and head to church. Amen? Amen. And our umbrella verse is Psalm 121.1, I mean 122.1. Let's all say that together. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And so when you come here, you are kind of in God's gym. You are building yourself up. You are pumping yourself up spiritually, all right? You're becoming stronger when you come in here. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So as we look and explore God's Word and, and see what God has to say uh, about His church, about you and me, then we are stronger, greater ambassadors for Him, more powerful, and by the way, you and I are freedom fighters. You and I are freedom fighters, and, and we are. We are trying to set people free. When God appeared to Saul, who became the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, you know, he said, if you'll read that, he said, I've called you to take people out of darkness into the light, the light of truth. I've called you to take people out of the power of Satan unto the power of God. Amen. And so that's what we're doing. We are God's freedom fighters here. L let me pray, okay? Father, we do thank you for this morning and we just ask for your blessing upon this service. Blessing upon me as I share your word. Touch each heart, Lord. Speak to us, Lord. May we leave this place stronger than we are right now and, and more able to serve you and more uh, have a greater desire to reach people with the truth of Jesus Christ, the love of Jesus Christ. And I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. The first verse I want us to look at this morning, and, 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 and it's, by the way, well, let me go through, kind of review real quickly here. The blessing of becoming a mature servant of Christ, which is a maturity founded upon bib a biblical perspective of life. All right, that's what we have. We don't just see through our natural eyes, but spiritual eyes. A maturity that grows in grace, a maturity that grows in the knowledge of God, and a maturity that understands and engages in spiritual warfare. Now, we're kind of just finishing up part three there, but we know that Satan is a deceiver of the lost. Satan is an adversary of the saved. Satan is to be resisted steadfastly in the faith. We're going to pick up on the end of that point. And finally, we'll look at this today. Satan will finally be defeated once and for all and eternally punished for his crimes against God and mankind. Hallelujah. That's going to happen. So the first verse I want us to look at today is 1 John 3.8. 1 John 3.8. It says, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning, and that means the beginning of the rebellion against God. He was created perfectly, but when he rebelled against God, that was the beginning of his rebellion. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Amen? So that's what you and I are doing. We are working with Christ. We are the church, and we are destroying the works of the devil. All of the evil and death and, and fear and hate and, and all sickness is caused by the fall. All of that is caused by the fall. And so what we are doing is helping, the, uh, as in the Lord's Prayer, we're saying, you know, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven that's what we're saying you know uh, we're asking the lord that his kingdom would come in this earth and so we're working that now he is sins is of the devil you know a lot of people don't know that but the bible teaches us that when you are not with christ guess who you belong to 
you are in his, you are a captive of Satan. You are. And there's a lot of people that don't know, but they are in that dark domain. They are living in that culture of death. And they don't know that. And when you come to Christ, you are living in a culture of life. Hallelujah. Of goodness and of joy and peace and all the good things that, that God has created. Satan never created anything. All he does is pervert what God has created. Right? That's all he does. He just messes it up. All right? And tries to pervert and deceive. And, and so he is here in this world so that we might be tested and so that we might know what sin and evil is and know the goodness of God. And it's a great, it's a great, God, it's, it's a great plan of God. And it sometimes just is beyond me. I say, I don't know, you know, it's, it's just amazing, this, this entire plan that God has for the church, for the salvation of the church to spend with him in eternity. And so the devil has sinned from the beginning. And so for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. There are the works of the devil going around in our culture today. When you turn on the nightly news, when you turn on the nightly news, it is filled with the works of the devil. I mean, all these horrendous crimes and things going on and shootings and stabbings and, 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 and thievery and all of these problems going on, it's caused by the works of the devil. It reminds me that at my other church, and sometimes you can kind of sense, and a lot of times we can't see it overtly, but sometimes you can kind of find, there are things going on. You can say, that, that's not of God, that's the work of the devil. When I was... Uh, pastoring in Granite, Oklahoma, I got a call one day and there was a lady that had come to our church quite frequently and uh, she lived over north of Lone Wolf and uh, she said, I got to talk to you about something. I said, what, what's going on? She said, my son wakes up crying in the middle of the night and he said, there's a creature in his room. There's a black creature or something that comes and scares him. And so I said, well, you know, have you seen it? She said, yes. It's kind of like a black shadow. You get this terrible feeling in your gut, your gut. I just texted her last week or so, and I was asking her how that went out. And I said, well, you know, that's the enemy. That's some kind of demonic spirit. And, you know, God is omnipresent. He can be everywhere at once. But the demonic spirits cannot. They are in one place at a time. They, we can't see them, but they travel around individually. And I said, we're going to have to take authority over that. I said, listen, I can't come out there right now. She lived way out in the country, uh, probably about 30 minutes from a, a drive in the country. I said, let's just pray over the phone. And she'd been telling me, you know, she'd gotten mad at this spirit before. And she said once she got so mad at the spirit, she told it, get out of her house. And the bulb and her lamp just went real bright and then blew up. All right. That wasn't her imagination. That was the enemy. And so we prayed over the phone. And man, we got down and we pleaded the blood of Jesus over that house, the blood of Jesus over her, over her children. We commanded that spirit in the name of Jesus Christ to get out of her house. And you know what? She said it went away. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just talked to her again. It had been several years ago. Well, quite a few. More than probably about 10 years ago. And I said, did that thing ever come back, that spirit? And she goes, nope. No, it left. So you have that authority. You have that power. Those are some of the works of the devil. And he's, he works through, you know, all kinds of ways. I mean, that's why we have war. If everyone were following the will of God, there would be no wars. We could tell all of our police department to find other jobs because they're no longer needed because everyone is doing the right thing. But that's not the way it is. Even though the enemy is defeated... His defeat has not been consummated, so in the meantime, you and I have to fight the good fight of faith. Sometimes when people say, how are you doing, and I'm not having the best day in the world or the best week or the best month, I tell them, I don't say I'm just fine. I'm just fine. I say I'm fighting the good fight of faith. File that away. File that away, because sometimes you can say, I'm fighting the good fight of faith, and that's what the Paul said, that the, the Christian motif when we're here upon this world it, when we're here on this earth, is to fight the good fight of faith, to be a soldier of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 1 through uh, 2, says, And you 
talking to the church at Ephesus, talking to Christians, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. He said, you and I were all there. A lot of people, they don't know it. They don't know it. They don't realize that what they're doing is under the influence of, the, of Satan. But he is the originator and instigator of all sin, of all fallenness. He is that person. And so he has made us alive because when you were not with Christ, you were dead in your sins. You were dead in your trespasses. Amen? And so you have been born again. Some people throw that around kind of carelessly, born again, you know, like I... There's country songs, you know, I met this sweet thing in a, I don't know, in a club, and I've been born again. No, you haven't, all right? All right. You just think you have, all right? Just give it a month, all right? All right. Anyway, all right. And then Jesus, one of the, the pre most precious verses in uh, the Bible is John 10.10, 10. and Jesus is talking about himself as being the good shepherd, of being the good shepherd. And he says this in John 10.10. 10, the thief, and we're going to say that's Satan, does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. Now see, the, the, the devil lies to people. The, the devil is lying to people today, telling them, you know, go out and do this, and the, the church is a killjoy, and you don't want to read that Bible, and you don't want to do those things because you're not going to have any fun. And the trouble with trouble is that it starts out as fun, all right? And so the enemy deceives you, and then you go, what in the world is going on? This is not fun. I mean, I've known people that have uh, been out in the, in the world in that lifestyle, and I was there for a while myself. When I was backslidden away from God for eight years, I thought I was having fun. And after a while, I thought, man, this is, this is, this is pitiful. I'm so empty, and there's got to be something more to life. I mean, it's got to be more to life than weekends are made for Michelob or whatever. I mean, there's more to life than that, you know. I mean, this, you know, if you think that you've got to smoke something or pop something or drink something to have a good time, you, something's wrong, all right? Because it's a downward spiral. It's a downward spiral. And so, you know, the world is so deceived today because Jesus will give you that abundant life. He will give you that which you're looking for. And, and I've said it before, but it's so true what Blaise Pascal said. In every person, there is a God-shaped vacuum that only God can fill. We were made to be with Him because He made us to spend eternity with Him. He has put eternity in our hearts. And so we, we have this desire, like, and we try to fill it up with stuff and things or materialism or ambitions and awards and whatever. You can't fill it up. You can, you can say, I, am, I won an NBA championship but if you don't know Jesus, it's not filling that up. You can say, I have $10 million in the bank. I have houses in Colorado and cabins and down beach houses in Florida. And I, I have a, a condo in Europe and all of that. But if you don't know Jesus, it's not going to fill you up here. You're not going to feel what you've been searching for, what you've been created for. And that is to know God as your heavenly Father. To be saved and born again. And then you find out really who you were intended to be. You're going, oh, wow. Some people think, so I lose myself in Christ. There's a paradox. You lose yourself, and you lose your life, and then you find it. It's a paradox. And you go, wow, what took me so long? You know? That's what happens when people really get sold out to the Lord. And then we're going to come to a good part here. Satan will finally be defeated once and for all and eternally punished for his crimes against God and mankind. We know in Revelation 12, 7 through 9, this talks about, about the battle of Armageddon has just happened. The battle of Armageddon, well, well, not yet ex ex exactly, but it's getting ready to happen in here. The battle of Gar Armageddon is getting ready to happen. This is talking about the tribulation. And even though Satan has been kicked out of heaven, he still somehow has access to God 
Because it says he accuses you and me, the brethren, the believers, night and day. That's what the Bible says. He said, man, are you, are you still trying to save those sorry people? Look what they've done, 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 done. And the father said, they're under the blood of Jesus, and I see my son's righteousness in them. You shut your mouth, Satan. They are my children, and my son, Jesus Christ, died upon the cross and paid every sin. But it says he still accuses us night and day. And it says about midway through the tribulation, this is what's going to happen. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Amen. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. It makes reference back into the Garden of Eden, that old serpent that deceived Eve and Adam. Called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And it says when that happens, that's when the Antichrist is going to declare himself to be God in that newly rebuilt built temple in Jerusalem. Now, some of you, this may be going over your head, but the tribulation is a seven-year period before Jesus comes back. And if you believe that, and there's going to be a thousand years after that, that's called a premillennial view. That's a premillennial view that Jesus comes back at the end of the tribulation and sets up a thousand-year reign. And many of the promises that are made in this Bible to Israel were never fulfilled in the Old Testament. They will be fulfilled there. And you and I, as God's children, will rule and reign with, with Christ for a thousand years from Jerusalem. Hallelujah. I don't know what that's going to be like, but it's going to be cool. All right? It's going to be awesome. But we know that... The Antichrist will then declare himself to God. He will persecute Israel. Then he will persecute all the saints in the world. He will require them to have the mark of the beast in order to buy or sell. And so it will be a horrific time. Uh, people say, some people say, oh, the church won't be there. Uh, I, that's what I hope. We won't be here. But there's things in the Bible that would indicate there will be believers here. There will be believers that come in, during the tribulation period. And some people say the believers will be raptured at mid-trib. And some even say post-trib. And so that's a, you know, it's all in God's hands. He's not asking. He's never asked an opinion, all right? <laughs> what do you think? But, but he's going to do, our job is to be ready at all times. But this is what's going to happen. And that at the end of the thousand, uh, at the end of the tribulation, Jesus Christ is going to come back. And I believe that you and I are going to come back with him. We are going to be caught up. We're going to be with him. And the Bible says that we are going to be, but get, get, get ready for this. We're going to be on white horses and come back with Jesus. Spiritual white horses. I don't know. It's like, I don't know how that's going to happen. But it's going to happen. Jesus is going to come back, and this is what the next thing that happens. Uh, well, this is talking about uh, Romans 16, 20. Let me go ahead, and I'm jumping ahead. I'm going to, I'm, hold that thought, because we're going to jump there. It says, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly, or speedily. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Paul wrote that to the church at Rome. Isn't that great? The God of peace is going to, that's not very cr peaceful to crush Satan's head. You know Why? Because he's the God, uh, little g, of chaos. And there can be no peace with him running around. So sometimes in order for, order for peace to prevail, you have to crush that which causes sin and chaos. Amen? Amen, that's a habit. Uh, I think it was Edmund Burke said the only uh, thing necessary for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. So when we see evil, when we see something's wrong that's not right, it is our duty. Sometimes it's messy. It's messy, but to get in there and cause things to come about that are right and fair and decent and godly. In fact, back way back in Genesis, the third chapter, this is called the gospel prolegomena. And prolegomena is a big word that really means the prologue to the gospel. And it says this. God is talking to Satan after he deceived the Eve, and he said, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers, and he, meaning Satan, will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. He said, My son is going to be the offspring of Israel. 
He is a descendant of Eve. He will come and die on the cross. And when he does that one day, that is the beginning of your demise because he will defeat you on Calvary. And that will be consummated one of these days in the lake of fire and brimstone. All right. So you're going to get yours. All right. Payday is coming. It may not happen, you know, on Friday. But payday is coming for Satan. Okay. He will get what he deserves one of these days. And so that, that kind of is the gospel all the way back in the very beginning of the Bible. Now, I told you about after the battle of Armageddon in Revelation 20, 1 through 3. After that battle, this is what happens to Satan. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit. That's part of hell. Okay, and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up, and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Now, who's going to be in the millennial kingdom? Well, it'll be believers but I believe a lot of the people that will be able to populate and have children and, and all that will be those that are under the age of accountability. Right now, I would say there's probably a billion children in this world right now that are under the age of accountability. We don't know for sure, but I, God is going to let them grow up. God is going to let them have families. And there will still be sin, there will still be death, but you, there will not be an adversary. Not only will Satan be bound, but all of his demons will be bound with him for a thousand years. And so it'll be kind of a new era uh, that's happening upon the earth. And our job is to tell people about sin and what we went through and that one of these days, guess what? He's going to be released again. And when he, why is he released again? Well, I believe it's to, there will be some still in spite of the fact that Christ is there upon the earth and we're ruling and reigning with Christ, there will still be some that won't believe. And when he's released for a little while, it'll call all, uh, the cohesion of all of these unbelievers to come together. And he will persuade them into a suicidal battle with God once more, just like he did with, at Armageddon. He's going to, he's going to, get Gog and Magog, and we believe Gog is the ruler of a group of people known as Magog, and they will come around Jerusalem, the holy city, to fight God, and he's going to snuff it out like that. In fact, let's read those verses, 7 through 10. 7 through 10. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, that's Jerusalem. And fire, this is how quick the battle ended, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Boom, all right. The devil, all right, and, uh, and the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. They were there active in the tribulation, tribulation. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. I didn't write that. You didn't write that. That is the place for Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and all unbelievers. And so one day, that's where he's going to be, end up. It's really odd when you think that he existed, Satan, Lucifer existed in four realms. He went from heaven to the earth to the bottomless pit or the abyss to the lake of fire and brimstone. He went from the very top to the very, very bottom because he wanted to be God. He rebelled against God and God's goodness and God's love. Very strange. It's very sad when you think about it. Now, Revelation 21, 1 through 5, after the great white throne of God, the Bible says that all believer, unbelievers will stand and they will also, those that were not written in the Lamb's book of life, will be cast also there because they, whether they knew it or not, they were complicit with Satan. They will be also cast into the lake of fire brimstone. And now here's the good part. Here's the good part. After Satan reaches his final eternal home, this is the good part right here. 
Now I saw, John writes, a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And, hallelujah, read this part, God will wipe away every, every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. These words are true and faithful. You and I will be giving each other high fives in that Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, one of these days. And you will never get tired. You will never get sick. You will never have pain. There will be no more sad goodbyes. There will be no more funerals. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Does that not get you excited? No more devil messing with the church. No more de devil messing with your family. No more devil in our society. Every day will be a perfect day. A glorious day. And we will all have assignments and jobs. And I don't know how it's going to be. But it will be the most incredible thing. Church, you are destined for greatness. Amen. Hallelujah. You are destined for greatness. It's so exciting. So therefore, fight that good fight every day knowing that I'm going to win. You may have to go and box with the devil. You may, you, may, you, know, you may have to go three rounds. You may have to go 10 rounds. You may have to go 15 rounds. But the Lord is going to give you a knockout punch one of these days. He's going to come down and stand by you and give you the power, and you, he will be defeated. The Lord himself will say, stand aside. Let me give him the final punch, and he's going down. He's going down. And he will not cause or persecute the church anymore. Let me close with this thought. Uh, my goodness, we finished the notes. I don't know. <laughs> but yesterday I, I, was the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing. I remember as uh, sitting in school, and I guess they replayed it several times, and watching on TV. I don't remember, but I remember watching it when Neil Armstrong got out of that moon lander and stepped upon the moon. And he said, one, that's one small step for man, one great leap for mankind. I remember that. And I was like, whoa, whoa. My grandfather, somehow, he, he thought it was a fake, a fake deal and they were doing it in a studio in Arizona. I was like, oh, Grant, anyway. Anyway. They landed on the moon. There is an American flag up there, probably one of the greatest feats ever of, of mankind to, to send a, a, someone to the moon. But you know what had to happen before they got to the moon? Scientists, NASA scientists, have come up with a, it's a very complicated theory or, or, or equation. And this equation is a physical, it's a physics equation. And they said in order to get into orbit and leave this earth, you have to have escape velocity. That's what they call it. You have to have escape velocity. You cannot leave the gravity of this earth unless you achieve escape velocity. Escape velocity is based on this. You have to have 72 million pounds of thrust that will take you to 25,000 miles an hour in order to break the bonds of gravity of this planet. Now, when they took off, when Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, Michael Collins took off to go to the moon, they couldn't flap their, said, we're going to the moon, everybody really flap hard. <laughs> they said, come on guys, let's, let's jump, let's, let's go on top of Mount Everest and start jumping. The only way they could get the escape velocity was to be in that rocket ship with all of its power in that capsule there and they had that power, just that incredible power that pushed them to the moon. And you know that power is found in the gospel. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. 
It is the power of God to salvation, unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And you know what? In order to have that escape velocity, to escape the power of sin, you need to be in Christ. And he has created on Calvary when he shed his blood, when he said, Tetelestai, it is finished. He gave you that escape velocity that you said, goodbye, Satan. See you later. Much later. And he gave you the power to escape the control of Satan. You are no longer a slave to fear, nor to Satan, nor to death, nor to hell. And your body will not even stay in that grave because one of these days it will be resurrected just like Jesus' body was resurrected on Easter morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. And so as we close this morning, I want to say, have you found that spiritual escape velocity? And that's only found in Jesus Christ. You cannot leave the planet of sin without Christ. He is the only way, the only Savior, the only way Under the heavens. Given them a, you know, there's, this is, there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's only one way out, and that's Jesus. So if you don't know him this morning as we close, would you give your heart and your life to Jesus? And if you're a Christian and you've just been kind of halfway, being a Christian just halfway, been compromising, this morning is an opportunity for you to give God everything. Because, listen, I've I've crossed a lot of barbed wire fences living in the country, and it's really painful to be caught hanging on a fence pose. I mean, (laughs) straddling the fence. It's really not a good position to be straddling the fence. You need to get on the Lord's side and get completely in the Lord's side and get in the center of His will. Amen? Let's pray. Let's pray. Father God, it has been a good morning. God, we just thank You for Your love. We thank You for Your spirit that we have felt here this morning. And we thank you, Lord, for that escape velocity that we have through the power of the gospel and the power of Christ to overcome the enemy. Yes, Lord, we are still fighting him, but we have the victory in Jesus. We have the victory. And one day, Lord, his defeat will be finalized forever and ever. And Lord, I pray that everyone here would know that their name is written in the Lamb's book of life and that means everybody that has their name written in the Lamb's book of life will be going to heaven and Lord I just pray that people wouldn't be guessing whether their name's there but they would know and the way they know is that I have asked Jesus Christ to be my personal Savior I have asked him to forgive me of my sins I have repented of my sins I've asked him to come into my life and to be my Lord, and I have demonstrated that by following Him and obeying His commandments. And when I sin, I repent quickly, and knowing that He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, if somebody doesn't know that this morning, I pray that they would come forward, that they would ask You to be their Lord and Savior, that they would give their life to You this morning. Lord, you have your will and your way this morning. This is your time, your invitation. Lead us by your spirit, and may we be obedient to your call. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Church, would you prayerfully stand this morning, and if God's touched your heart, if God's speaking to you about a decision you need to make right now, you make it. Will you make it? Take my life, lead me, Lord. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Make my life useful to Thee. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Make my life useful to Thee. If you need to come, you just come. You obey the Lord. Take my life, teach me, Lord. Take my life, teach me, Lord. Make my life useful to Thee. Take my life, teach me, Lord. Take my life, teach me, Lord. 
make my life useful to me. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Just remember, no 55 and better this month. Uh, it's been postponed because of the work in the fellowship hall until August. Tonight at 6 o'clock, we're going to have uh, our uh, continuation of we're talking about heaven. We're going to be looking at Revelation 21 and 22, okay? And we, it's kind of a, a finalization of, uh, of what we've been studying about, uh, about heaven. Oh, and also, yeah, well, Willow, you want to come? I know you were up here last week, but she's our newest member of the church. Would you just come on up here? Some of you want to, are going to want to hug her neck and again, or maybe you weren't here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. All right. All right. All right. Well, so excited to have Willow, and uh, God bless you. Have a great day in Jesus. All right. <laughs>